Hey friends, so today's video is not what I anticipated uploading today. I had anticipated or I had planned and was all ready to go with my fashion math, which was going to be episode or part number three of my decluttering organizing series. Uh, but then Hermes got sued in a class action suit. So I thought, you know what? This is timely. Let's talk about it and, and see what we all think. So this has now been reported in, I think, the LA Times. It was, I think, originally picked up by Business of Fashion. I'll have some of these articles linked below. I actually have a copy of the actual uh, complaint, the actual lawsuit itself. So this is what we're going to be going through today. And I'll, um, you know, throw in maybe a couple of opinions here, but just kind of wanted to break down for those of you who, you know, are not familiar with the law and things like that, what this means, what the uh, plaintiffs or the people who are bringing this action, so that's what a plaintiff is, uh, what they're alleging, what they want out of it, all those kind of things. So uh, with that being said, grab a beverage, grab a snack, maybe some, maybe some wine would be good, but uh, yeah, let's dig into this case and uh, We'll see what they're alleging and asking for. Just a couple of disclaimers. I am not an antitrust attorney. So, you know, I'm gonna be reading these things. I will give you a little background on some of the different claims that they're making, the actual federal acts. Uh, and then there's one individual like California law that they are bringing uh, this suit in relation to, but I'm not an antitrust lawyer. I don't deal in antitrust. I don't even think I took anything regarding antitrust in law school. So just, you know, take that with a grain of salt, I guess. So just so you know, this is a class action lawsuit. And what that means is that there is essentially more than one plaintiff. And what it will also allow is that other people can join the class and potentially get a portion of any damages that are awarded if there are any, okay? So there are two law firms involved in this lawsuit, at least according to the um, header here. And this was brought in the United States District Court of the Northern District of California. My understanding, both of the current plaintiffs that are a part, the named plaintiffs that are a part of the lawsuit, are California residents, which is why it was brought in California. It has been brought against. So the plaintiffs, the people who brought the lawsuit, brought this class action, are a woman named Tina and a gentleman named Mark. Uh, this is all public record, by the way. You can download this yourself and, and see this. I'm not I'm not disclosing any private information. This is all of public record. The United States has something called the Sunshine Act and you are able to get public records basically at any time. They are bringing this lawsuit against Hermes International, a French corporation and Hermes of Paris Inc, a New York corporation and what they're calling Doe's. So like Jane or John Doe's one through 10, and we'll talk about that in a second. And they're bringing their complaint uh, in violation of the Sherman Act, in violation of two different parts of the Cartwright Act, and then a violation of the unfair competition law uh, under the codes of California. And they have asked, I just noticed, for a jury trial is demanded. All right. So let's, like I said, get into the actual complaint here. Uh, the nature of this action. The, this is an antitrust and unfair business practices class action arising out of defendants, we know who they are, Hermes, unlawful practice of tying the purchase of defendants' popular Birkin bags to the purchase of other defendants' luxury clothing and accessory items. As set forth herein, defendant's practices are unlawful. In this action, plaintiff on behalf of themselves and other similarly situated seek compensatory and punitive damages and appropriate injunctive relief. 
We'll talk about that in the end. But again, this is a class action, so they're bringing it on behalf of themselves and perhaps anybody else that may qualify for being a part of the class. When I talked about, I said the other defendant does in this case, it says the true names and capacities, whether individual, corporate, partnership, associate, or otherwise of defendants does one through 10 inclusive are unknown to plaintiffs. So basically what they're doing is they're reserving the right to add any potential individually named defendants. So, you know, for example, if Joe Bob, who is probably not Joe Bob, but anyway, if Joe Bob, who is the president of marketing came up with this, or, you know, they find some memo or something that, and by the way, this, this is all alleged. I mean, I'm reading these things that are stated here, but anything else I say is alleged. I'm just giving you an example of like what this could mean and why they're reserving the right to potentially add defendants. So like I said, let's say, I don't know if you guys watched, um, I'm trying to remember the name of that movie. It was with, uh, it, it's basically about the tobacco industry and the whistleblower thing that happened in the tobacco industry. And, you know, emails or memos, I don't think emails existed back then. Um, and just FYI, one of the biggest, uh, defense firms who represented the tobacco industries based in Kansas City, just FYI. Uh, anyway, there were a lot of smoking guns there. There were, like I said, memos that were drafted from, you know, executives to others in that particular case of, of the tobacco industry of, you know, they knew that it was doing certain things health-wise and that they were trying to quash that information, et cetera. Let's say, for example, that that Joe Bob, who, like I said, maybe is the CEO of marketing or something, who knows, or the, the head of marketing, the chief marketing officer, CMO, you know, sent some email to some, you know, all the people at the heads of the directors of all the stores and said, you guys can only sell Birkins to people who, you know, spend at least $10,000 in the store, whatever. like they're reserving the right to bring in those potential defendants. Hopefully that makes sense. Then we have a whole bunch more discussion about the parties. And then we've got something called jurisdiction and venue, which basically is a part of the complaint that establishes to the court that they have jurisdiction over this case and why. All right, here are the factual allegations. A, Hermes. Hermes is a world famous designer and producer of high quality merchandise, including inter alia, that's a legal term, luxury handbags, basically it's the uh, equivalent of including but not limited to. Luxury handbags, apparel, scarves, jewelry, fashion accessories, and home furnishings. For decades, Hermes has developed its reputation and distinctive image. Hermes or origins date back to 1837 and it goes into their history, blah, blah, blah. Hermes is the exclusive distributor or licensor in the United States of its merchandise. In other words, it doesn't sell through any resellers or anything like that. Hermes sells its products directly to consumers through Hermes owned retail stores and parenthesis, except for Birkin handbags, through its website at www.hermes.com. Hermes currently operates approximately 43 stores in the United States with eight of those retail stores located in California. B, the Birkin handbag. Hermes is well known for its famous Birkin and Kelly handbags, collectively Birkin handbag, which are exclusive Hermes design. Each Birkin handbag is handcrafted from the finest leather by experienced artisans in France. The manufacturing of a single Birkin handbag requires many hours of an artisan's time. The intensive labor and craftsmanship and high quality leathers required making required make the Birkin handbag difficult to produce and expensive. The price of a Birkin handbag from the price of a Birkin handbag from thousands of dollars to over $100,000. We have some grammatical errors here. Apologies. The, this is a quote, the desirability of an Hermes Birkin handbag, a symbol of rarefied wealth is such that not even a global pandemic can dull demand for it, 
end quote. In the second quarter of 2021, Hermes sales for the leather and saddlery division, which includes the Birkin handbags, more than doubled from a year ago and rose by 24% from their pre-pandemic June 2019 levels. Despite the price and exclusivity, the Birkin handbag has become a household name and well-known by the general public, both in name and by its distinctive design. Since as early as 2000, Hermes has expended millions of dollars in the United States advertising the Birkin handbag. As a result of such advertising, since 2000, Hermes has sold thousands of Birkin handbags. The Birkin handbag is an icon of fashion. A September 2021 Vanity Fair article noted that, quote, there is a kind of fashion object so long lasting, so tirelessly wanted that its name becomes recognizable, a metonym for the brand that made it, colon, the Air Jordan, the love bracelet. Few brands, successful though they may be, attain that kind of saturation, end quote. C, defendant's illegal tying with the Birkin bag. And this is what this lawsuit really boils down to, is the tying of the purchase of other extraneous uh, items to then being able to buy a Birkin. And this is really where the Sherman Act comes in and the whole tying aspect. The unique desirability, incredible demand, and low supply of Birkin handbags give defendants incredible market power. Defendants implemented a scheme to exploit this market power by requiring consumers to purchase other ancillary products from defendants before they will be given an opportunity to purchase a Birkin handbag. With this scheme, defendants were able to effectively increase the price of Birkin handbags and thus the profits that defendants earn from Birkin handbags. All right, here's one of the kickers. Birkin handbags cannot be purchased from defendants through the Hermes website. Instead, consumers can only purchase handbag Birkin handbags from defendants by physically going to an Hermes retail store. However, unlike most consumer products, and most other products sold by defendants, consumers cannot simply walk into an Hermes retail store, pick out a Birkin handbag they want, and purchase it. Birkin handbags are never publicly displayed for sale at Hermes retail stores. Indeed, it is often the case that there are no Birkin handbags at all at Hermes retail stores, or if they are, there are only one, two, or at the most, three Birkin handbags. But even if there are Birkin handbags at a particular MS retail store, the handbags will not be displayed on the sales floor for the general public. In fact, most consumers will never be shown a Birkin handbag at Hermes retail stores. Typically, only those consumers who are deemed worthy of purchasing a Birkin handbag will be shown a Birkin handbag, parenthesis, in a private room. The chosen consumer will be given the opportunity to purchase the specific Birkin handbag which they are shown. Consumers cannot order a Birkin handbag at the retail location. For all practical purposes, there is no way to order a bag in the style, size, color, leather, and hardware for that that the consumer wants. Hermes sales associates are tasked by defendants with selecting those consumers who are qualified to purchase Birkin handbags. These sales associates are directed by defendants to only offer Birkin handbags to consumers who have established a sufficient purchase history or purchase profile with defendants of defendants' ancillary products such as shoes, scarves, belts, jewelry, and home goods. Only once a consumer has a sufficient purchase history or purchase profile with defendants will the consumer be offered the opportunity to purchase a Birkin handbag. All right, this next paragraph I thought was super interesting because it actually goes into the commission structure of sales associates. I don't know where they got this information, but frankly, I was really surprised by it. Defendants have designed the compensation structure of sales associates to ensure that sales associates follow defendants' policy of only selling Birkin handbags to consumers who have a sufficient purchase history of ancillary products. Hermes sales associates are paid by the hour and also receive a commission on their sales. The commission rates paid by defendants to sales associates differ based on the type of product sold. 
Sales associates are paid 3% on ancillary products such as shoes, scarves, belts, jewelry, and home goods. They are paid 1.5% commission on non-Birkin handbags, and they receive no commission whatsoever on the sale of Birkin handbags. Now that's something that we've heard for a long time, right? That they do not make a commission on selling a Birkin or basically any quota bag. But apparently, according to this complaint, uh, to this lawsuit, they are paid one and a half percent on non-Birkin handbags. So for example, when I bought my Picatin or whether when I bought my Evelyn's or whatever, those, they got a one and a half percent sales commission. Although Hermes sales associates receive no commission on the most valuable and sought after products sold by their employer, they are instructed by defendants to use Birkin handbags as a way to coerce consumers to purchase ancillary products sold by defendants, parentheses, for which the sales associate receive a 3% commission, end parentheses, in order to build up the purchase history required to be offered a Birkin handbag. In this way, defendants are able to use their sales associates to implement defendants' illegal tying arrangement. I'll link the link to the actual lawsuit um, in the description box below if you want to read yourselves. But the next few paragraphs go into basically the history of these two particularly particular plaintiffs and you know what they purchased what they were told, what they were promised, promised, you know, within quotes. Um, anyway, and the fact that they could not buy a Birkin. All right, then the next section are class action allegations, which basically is setting up the um, understanding of why this is being brought as a class action. And it, it's basically like legal stuff that you guys probably don't care anything about. All right. The first claim for relief. So like I said, there are four claims that the plaintiffs are alleging that the defendants violated these particular four laws. The first and the one I personally think probably holds the greatest water uh, is the violation of the Sherman Act, uh, which is 15 USC section two. So the Sherman Act prohibits monopolization of any part of the trade or commerce, commerce among the several states or within foreign nations. And it basically says, the availability of the Birkin handbags is conditioned on customers purchasing ancillary products from defendants. In other words, consumers are coerced into purchasing ancillary products from defendants by virtue of wanting to purchase the Birkin handbags. This is anti-competitive tying conduct. The tying product, the Birkin handbag, is separate and distinct from the tied products, the ancillary products, required to be purchased by consumers because consumers, such as plaintiffs, have alternate options, excuse me, have alternative, is the appropriate word, options for the ancillary products and would prefer to choose among them independently from their decision to purchase Birkin handbags. Defendants' unlawful tying arrangements thus ties two separate products that are in separate markets. So to help you understand sort of the concept of tying, I mean, like we all understand what it means, right? So this is from the Federal Trade Commission uh, for the United States, and it describes what the tying of the sale of two products are. Offering products together as a part of a package can benefit consumers who like the convenience of buying several items at the same time. Offering products together can also reduce the manufacturer's cost for packaging, shipping, blah, blah, blah. Of course, some consumers might prefer to buy products separately. And when they are offered as a part of a package, it can be more difficult for consumers to buy only what they want. For competitive purposes, a monopolist may use force buying or tie-in sales to gain sales in other markets where it is not dominant and to make it more difficult for rivals in those markets to obtain sales. This may limit consumer choice for buyers wanting to purchase one tying product by forcing them to also buy a second tied product as well. Typically, the tied product may be a less desirable one that the buyer might not purchase unless required to do so, or may prefer to get from a different seller. If the seller offering the tied products 
has sufficient market power in the tying product, these arrangements can violate antitrust laws. And then they give this example. So the FTC challenged a drug maker that required patients to purchase its blood monitoring services along with its medicine to treat schizophrenia. The drug maker was the only producer of the medicine, okay? So they had the, they were the only ones that produced this particular type of medication. However, there were many companies capable of providing the blood monitoring services to patients using that drug, okay? So the drug company produced this very specific drug that only they produced, but there are lots of companies that produce this drug, this blood monitoring service that those people who are taking those drugs need, okay? They need that service to be able to make sure that their, you know, different levels of their blood, et cetera, are, are not being influenced, you know, um, detrimentally by taking the schizophrenia medicine. So what was happening is that this drug manufacturer was basically forcing you, a person who was going to needed to buy that schizophrenia medicine to also buy their blood monitoring services. The FTC claimed that tying the drug and monitoring services together raised the price of that medical treatment and prevented independent providers from monitoring patients taking the drug. And then they basically talk about that it was settled and blah, blah, blah. So the idea here is that buying a Birkin, okay, let me, let me take a, you know, uh, maybe something that might make more sense. Let's take a coffee maker, for example, okay? So you buy a coffee maker and you buy the filters that go in the coffee maker and you buy the coffee grounds that go into it. But before the coffee maker company will let you buy their coffee maker, they say you have to buy these specific coffee mugs. Okay, well, you don't need a specific coffee mug to make that product work, okay? That's really what tying is talking about. In other words, if like, for example, when the Virtuo machine for Nespresso came out originally, Nespresso was the only ones that made those pods. There, there weren't any like third party ones or, you know, sort of aftermarket ones or et cetera. And so if I wanted to have coffee, I had to buy those pods. That's not tying because it's not keeping me from buying something else that would also work in its place, right? I cannot operate the Virtuo machine without a Virtuo pod. Like I said, I'm talking about like back in the day. So the idea here is that for Hermes to say, you have to buy this necklace and that plate and that sweater and those pair of shoes before you can buy a Birkin is tying products that have absolutely nothing to do with the ability to use your Birkin. The only product that I might like, and this is really like reaching, okay, that I could see that they might be able to tie to the purchase of a Birkin would be a Twilly, okay? Sort of like, you need to protect the handles, so you need to buy a Twilly. Like, again, I'm reaching here, okay? But that's basically the idea, right? Is that they are tying products that have absolutely nothing to do with the Birkin or the functionality of the Birkin or the use of the Birkin in order to be able to buy it. That's what that means. Okay, the next two claims for relief are both based on the Cartwright Act. I'm not as subscribed to these particular claims as I am to the one under the Sherman Act. So the, the, the first, which is uh, section 16700, which prohibits uh, the combination of resources by two or more persons to restrain trade or commerce or commerce or to prevent market competition. Under the Cartwright Act, a combination is formed when the anti-competitive conduct of a single firm coerces the market participants to involuntarily adhere 
to the anti-competitive scheme. And then it goes on to say the Cartwright Act also makes it, quote, unlawful for any person to, I'm going to, it talks about leasing too. I'm going to delete that language because it doesn't apply here. Unlawful for any person to make a sale or contract for the sale of goods, blah, 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 for use within the state or to fix a price charged, therefore, or discount from or rebate upon such price on the condition agreement or understanding that the purchaser thereof shall not use or deal in the goods, merchandise, blah, 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 of a competitor or competitors of the seller where the effect of such sale, blah, 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 so I'm trying to cut out some things, may be to substantially lessen competition or tend to create a monopoly in any line of trade or commerce in any section of the state. The idea here is that by forcing you to buy scarves and twillies and jewelry and shoes and whatever in order to purchase a Birkin that they are violating the Cartwright Act because they are in a sense doing it <clears throat> and forcing you to do it so that you don't purchase those things from Chanel or you know Louis Vuitton or whoever, another, frankly, could be Zara. I mean, right? I'm not quite sure that I find this particular claim super, it's not that I don't think it's valid. I just think that this particular claim would be better brought, for example, by Chanel or by Louis Vuitton. In other words, that they would be claiming, look, Hermes, you are forcing people to buy your shoes in order to get a Birkin. And because of that, they're not buying Chanel shoes. And so we're losing business as because of that and you are violating the Cartwright Act. Not quite sure, I mean, I understand that they're basically saying in the two Cartwright Act um, claims that the plaintiffs then were essentially prohibited from buying other competitors' products in those categories. I'm, I'm just not entirely sure that that is something that one could prove. I mean, you know, because I bought this necklace, does that mean that I couldn't go buy a necklace from Chanel? No, not really. But anyway, that's just, again, my kind of opinion on the uh, on the Cartwright Act claims. There's two different ones. Uh, the one, like I said, under uh, 16720, and the second one is under 16727. But essentially, they're, they're, they're very similar claims. Okay, the fourth claim for relief is based on uh, California's unfair competition law, which is under their California Business and Professional Code, section 17200 at SEC. And basically, that code prohibits engaging in lawful, in unlawful business acts or practices. Okay, so that's pretty basic. As a direct and proximate result of defendants' unlawful business practices, plaintiffs and the class have suffered injury in fact and lost money or property in that they purchased ancillary products from defendants that they did not want or could have purchased elsewhere, okay? It's a pretty, I, I'm guessing that this is sort of just thrown in for the heck of it, kind of. I mean, it's just one more thing. So prayer for relief, we're, we're, we're at the end here, people, and then I'll kind of talk to you about my feelings about this. This is what they have asked for. So prayer for relief is basically saying, okay, court, this is what we want you to do. Uh, we want you to certify the class. So that's kind of the very first thing that has to happen. The class has to be certified in order for the class action to move forward. They want an order enjoining defendants from continuing to engage in the practices complained of herein. So basically they want an order saying, Hermes, you can't do this anymore. 
Three, they want an award of restitution, damages, and disgorgement. I had to read that twice. Uh, to plaintiffs in the class and subclass in the amount determined at trial. Number four, an order requiring defendants to pay both pre- and post-judgment interest on any amounts awarded. Uh, they want attorney's fees and any other such relief that may seem appropriate. All right, let me put this down and, and we'll chat. All right, so let's chat about my thoughts about the lawsuit and... Do I think it has merit? Do, how do I, I don't know. Well, we'll talk about it. Certainly, I think it has merit. Um, you know, I think anecdotally, those of us in the United States, there are, you know, threads upon threads upon threads in, you know, the purse forum, et cetera, of people talking about this sort of linked or tied sales. Like I said, I think it's very, very well known that in most parts of the world, there does seem, seem, again, I this is just alleged that this kind of practices are going on. It definitely seems as though in Canada from, you know, watching, for example, Fashionably Amy's videos on how she got her bags and certainly many, many <laughs> different uh, content creators in the United States, how they've gotten their bags. Now, there are certain pockets of the United States where this isn't quite the same, uh, although I do still think that there are implications uh, that you should spend some. It just isn't so much based on a building a relationship over time and how much you're spending. So, you know, there definitely are more cases of somebody walking into a boutique in Las Vegas, for example, or in Hawaii and being able to get an offer for something. Now, generally, when you see those, it's not just a, they walk in, hey, looking for a Birkin 25 in gold with gold hardware, do you have one? Oh, sure, here you go, buy it. Generally, there does seem to be some other purchasing going on before that offer is made. It always sort of seems like maybe you go in, you buy some things, you talk to the sales associate, hey, I'm here for another few days, you know, I'm really looking for this bag or a bag of this type, you know, would love if you get one in before I leave to have a chance to buy it. And then, you know, lo and behold, maybe the next day or the day after you get that call from that sales associate. So it, it there does seem to be a little bit of this kind of linked selling or tied selling in all in the, these locations. I just don't think necessarily quite to the extent that we have read about many of the other markets, right? I mean, if you go on the purse forum, you know, you'll read, you know, in, Dallas, you know, you have to have at least a two to one spend, pre-spend ratio in order to get offered a bag. Some places are three to one, some places are one to one, some places are less than one to one. It, it's all over the board, okay? I don't know what'll happen with this lawsuit. I think it's interesting. Um, like I said, it will be interesting to see what evidence is brought out. I think that will be some of the most interesting parts of this particular case. It will be interesting to see if they just settle this lawsuit out of court and have the, you know, what damages are paid and everything, if that will be sealed. My personal opinion, like I said, of the actual claims that are made, I think the strongest claim is the Sherman Act claim. Not quite so sure that the uh, Carter Act ones, and like I said, I think that California one was just kind of thrown in there, not probably something that's going to be super strong. Um, like I said, I certainly, I would be very curious to see if, you know, maybe Chanel would join the suit or something to sort of bolster that, those Cartwright Act claims. Because to me, while yes, I, I understand what the, the plaintiffs are saying, they're saying, you know, you're making me buy this scarf 
and I didn't really want to buy that scarf from you. I wanted to buy it from somebody else. And so because I bought it from you, I was then prohibited from buying it from somebody else. I just don't see that as closely tied. Like I said, I just, I think the, the idea more of, you know, I want to buy this product, but you are forcing me to buy all of these other products that have absolutely nothing to do with this bag, okay? Me buying a watch or a pair of shoes has nothing to do with the use of this bag or any bag for that matter. So I know that recently Jasleen from The Real Shaquin has I think posted on her Instagram stories I think a little while ago when she saw kind of a temporary sign and I guess now it's basically a permanent sign. I haven't been into Hermes recently. You know, I probably should go and see if this is also like on the count, the checkout counters or wherever in the United States boutiques. But at least in Canada, in her store, they have posted a sign basically saying, uh, it's sort of twofold. One, we don't accept gifts. Like our sales associates don't accept gifts uh, in order to get things. So no, and, and this has also been a very long standing and well known thing. Like you can't give your Hermes sales associate any kind of personal gift that can't be shared with the rest of the staff. So you could absolutely bring them a dozen, you know, Krispy Kreme donuts or a dozen crumbled cookies, okay? Something that the whole staff could share. You cannot give your Hermes sales associate a gift card to Target or Starbucks or whatever. So something that only they can use. At least that's my understanding. I, I personally have never given my sales associates any kind of, I've never tried to give them any kind of gifts, but that, that's sort of my understanding of how that works. If it's something that can be shared amongst the staff, like I said, like food kind of thing, then it's fine, but you can't give like an individual gift. But the other part of the sign specifically states that, you know, that they don't tie sales of one product to another. I think when she first saw the sign, it was like right around holiday time. I think she's mentioned that she hadn't been into the boutique for quite a while, like really, I don't think at all prior to that in 2023. So who knows how long that sign had been there. But like I said, she had just been in recently and no noticed that the sign was now permanent because I, I feel like it was just on her Instagram stories like last week that she saw that it was now like in a sort of silver, etched like very nice high-end looking sign so yeah i should should run over to uh hermes on madison avenue and uh see see whether they have that sign too that would be interesting so you know i don't know if that was in sort of preparation you know again conspiracy theory here you know with the with the tinfoil hat on you know, was that because they knew that this lawsuit was getting ready to be filed and they're trying to sort of preempt and say, hey, we've, 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 we have this statement here that says we can't do this and we don't do this. Who knows? Again, this is all as, as Super Jacob would say. And by the way, I understand that Super Jacob, I think, is not feeling very well. I think he was in the emergency room or something, I think if I saw on Instagram. So Jacob, I, I certainly hope that you are doing better and that you are on your road to recovery for what was going on. But as Super Jacob would say, this is for all for entertainment purposes. Nothing you know, said here is based in root or fact. This is just my opinion. And yeah, so don't come for me basically. <laughs> Uh, so yeah, like I said, it will be interesting. I will be curious to see what happens. Like I said, I think some of the most interesting thing that may come out of this, if we actually get to see it move forward, uh, will be based on some of the discovery perhaps that is brought forth, you know, during this lawsuit. But I certainly would not even come close to betting on my children's lives that this lawsuit will see the light of day in court. Either it will be thrown out <laughs> by the court or for lack of evidence or something like that, uh, or 
it'll probably be settled out of court and we'll we'll never know really what the evidence is what happened you know because that that i'm sure will all be under non-disclosure and they won't be able to talk about it so anyway so that's it those are my thoughts um Hopefully this was interesting to you all. I certainly thought it was very interesting. Like I said, lots of different uh, news agencies and newspapers and things are picking up the story. So there's lots of different places that you can read about it. But like I said, I will have the actual lawsuit linked below. If those of you also, you know, if you're a nerd like me and, and want to read the actual complaint, uh, as well as to a couple of the, like I said, the news stories. I know the LA Times did it. Like I said, Fashion of Business did it. So I'll certainly link those too. And yeah, let me know your thoughts. I would love to have a discussion about this in the comment section. I'm sure there will be lots of people who would like to weigh in on this. So let me know your thoughts. And uh, yeah, if you enjoyed this video, give it a thumbs up. It helps the YouTube algorithm. And it really does, especially if you guys watch till the very end of the video, that really, really helps the algorithm. So if you stuck it out this long, I greatly appreciate it. If you haven't subscribed, I don't normally talk about legal kind of stuff, but it's obviously in relation to luxury. So I thought I would throw my two cents in. Uh, consider subscribing, click the link below and the notification bell. If you haven't had enough of me yet, I'll pop another video up here for you to watch. And wherever you are, I hope you are having an amazing day or evening. And I'll catch you in the next video, which will be my fashion math. So stay tuned. Like I said, I just kind of bumped part three out of the lineup for today to upload this video. So hopefully you enjoyed it and we'll be back to that decluttering organizational series, I guess, tomorrow. See you guys. Bye.